When it comes to networking, Linux isn't the most performant operating system because, well, all the traffic needs to be handled by the kernel, which uses significant amounts of processing power to do so. This actually becomes even more important with 10 gigabit speeds, which is why most popular open source routing solutions such as OpenSense and PFSense use FreeBSD and the main reason for that is the stateful packet filter that it comes with. But what if I told you we managed to set up a Linux board that easily handles full 10 gigabit throughput, not only between regular networks, but also between VLANs or even through PPPoE, and it does all of it in a way which pretty much completely bypasses all the ARM CPU cores, leaving them in idle. And when I say idle, I mean idle, as in 0% utilization. And to make matters even more interesting, it requires only minimal amounts of power. Amazing. Hi, if you're new here, welcome. My name is Tomáš and together with my business partner Aliash, we're trying to build a high-end router that will not only look good on the shelf or on a rack if that's more your thing, but will also easily route 10 gigabit traffic without breaking a sweat. And today I'm going to prove it. It's performance that is, because to see the final design, you'll have to subscribe for the grand reveal sometime in the coming weeks. And for those of you who have been following my channel for a while, or at least have seen my previous video, which I'll link to up here, then you know I've been trying my best to get my hands on the NXP's ASK, as it is called, or Application Solutions Kit. This kit is basically a suite of drivers, kernel patches and a couple of user space scripts that essentially manages hardware offloading of the network traffic. And I'm not just talking about your regular traffic, it's capable of fully offloading VLANs, PPPoE traffic and even the majority of IPsec protocols. I'll leave a link to the NXP page that pretty much lists everything that can be offloaded so that you can check it out for yourself. But in this video, I'll just focus on the regular traffic, simply because I don't have any kind of test harness slash setup developed yet. So for now, we're all just going to have to trust that it can do all the other stuff just the same. Of course, everything will be tested properly in due time, and I will show you the results of those tests of one way or the other. But for this video, let's just focus on simple routing between two separate networks. And yes, that does mean that I finally managed to get my hands on the ASK evaluation kit, but unfortunately, well, at least for now, only one of the two versions, the one that's packaged up in an open WRT distribution, meaning I got an image file which I flashed the NORCHAP, NORCHAP, <laughs> NOR flash chip with and then booted directly into the open WRT. Why unfortunately? Well, because the ASK also comes in a modular version that doesn't require OpenWRT and it's that one I'm kind of more interested in, simply because I think it's much much more versatile and can be used with other Linux based operating systems as well, uh, BioS being the one candidate I'd like to test with it the most. Now here's where I misunderstood the documentation a little bit initially. You see. I was under the impression that the ASK is a single binary that you simply upload to the device and run in order to get the hardware offloading up and running. But that is not quite the case. Well, at least it's not the full picture. You see, there's around 15 other components that also need to be either installed, configured or patched for it to all work together properly. Unfortunately, I can't go much more into details here because the documentation comes with this big red confidential watermark all over it and furthermore, I did sign an NDA, but what I can share is that this modular variant basically comes with a bunch of patches, not only for the kernel, but also for the most commonly used networking programs and libraries such as IPRoute2 and StrongSwan. And additionally, it also provides custom firmware and network drivers. And finally, a couple of user space binaries that all combined allow us to control and configure the whole hardware offloading stack. However, there is a problem with all of this and it's not a technological one. 
As you probably know, I want to open source as much of our work as possible. And if you've seen my previous video, then you also know that this ASK is not, in fact, an open source solution. We're currently planning a call with NXP to determine what kind of options we have with this. But according to our communication with them thus far, and the documentation that comes with this kit, the least we can do uh, that the license permits is distribute the binaries along with our devices so that you'll be able to use the software to its full potential, but you won't be able to get or see the source files. Think of it like this. In order to get the ASK to work, we'll use a number of kernel patches you won't be able to get, but the kernel that we will build with these patches you will be able to get and use. I don't think that's a huge problem, given that in my previous video, the vast majority of you said that this is something you'd happily tolerate in exchange for the wild performance numbers I'm about to show you. But still, it's worth pointing out so that you can all see that, unfortunately, we can't always get what we want. I guess my parents were right in this regard. Okay, let's now move on to the actual tests. But before we begin, I should mention that I'm not performing these tests on our board. Well, simply because it's not quite done yet. But because it will feature the exact same CPU that I am running these tests on, I don't expect it to behave any differently. The only difference we made is pick a 1.6 GHz version as opposed to 1.8 GHz one that's on this board. The CPU model that we're using is the NXP Layerscape LS1046A and the board that it comes on is called the Reference Design Board the purpose of which is exactly to run these kinds of tests to see whether the CPU is the right fit for our purposes. And boy is it ever. This episode is brought to you by PCBWay. I've been working with them on my custom keyboard project and I was super impressed with their speed, quality and price, so I'm more than happy to recommend them to anyone who needs any kind of PCB manufacturing done, whether it's just for a couple of prototypes or if you need a larger production run. Link to their website, of course, down in the description. Back to the video. But before I show you, I think it's worth spending a minute or two explaining how this test is performed. As I mentioned earlier, I don't have any kind of specialized approach to this. I literally connected one 10 gig port on the reference board to my development server, which has a 10 gig card in it, and it will serve as the iPerf server. And the other 10 gig port I connected to a 10 gigabit Mikrotik switch. This switch also has my Mac Studio connected to it with a 10 gig RJ45 port, and it's on the Mac Studio that I'll run the iPerf client. Now, if we map those three devices to the panes in my terminal, here's how they look. The top left one is my Mac Studio, which, as I said, will use as the iPerf client and it runs on the 10.0.0.0 network. Below it is the development machine running Debian Linux and it gets its IP from the DHCP server that is being handled by OpenWRT on the development board. In my case, the IP that it got is 192.168.1.214, which means that yes, it's on a separate network. I mean, we are trying to test the routing capabilities of the device after all. And finally, both of the right side panes are connected to the development board, simply because I want to show you the behavior of the CPU cores during the test, which is our top right pane, and also show you a couple of interesting things that prove that the hardware offloading is indeed working properly. Okay, enough explaining, let's see some action. The first thing we'll do is run a version of top called HTOP in the top right pane. The only part I want you to focus on here is their core utilization on the device, which as you can see for the time being is pretty much at 0% on all four cores. I think at this point we actually have everything ready for our iPerf test. So let's bring up the iPerf server on our development machine and finally start the test by running iPerf client on my Mac Studio. Boom! Full 10 gigabit routing, but what's even more fascinating is the fact that all four CPU cores are still at 0%. Not 5%, not 10%, 0%. And we can prove the kernel's non-involvement in this traffic if we run the TCP dump on the bridge interface that our LAN port is a member of. See how it reports no traffic despite the fact that we're pushing a gigabyte through the device every single second? 
Well, that means that the hardware offloading is working correctly and one additional way we can prove that is to query the connections by using a binary that the ASK comes with called CMM. If we run it with the parameters that you see on screen, you see that indeed two connections are established between iperf client and iperf server and an SSH connection is established between my Mac Studio and the iperf server as well. And if we cancel the iperf test, those connections are gone. Now, if you had to guess how much more power do you think that the CPU uses while the test is running as opposed to when it's not? And I'm not talking about the full power consumption of the CPU, just the difference in watts when the iperf test is up. Actually, pause the video and write in the comments down below. I'm genuinely curious whether anyone can guess correctly. You done? 1.2, as in 1.2 watts. See on my multimeter how it goes from around 1.27 amps to around 1.37? That's a 100 milliamp difference, and if we multiply them with 12 volts, which is the voltage that our board runs on, we get 1.2 watts. Okay, now that you've seen what our CPU is capable of, I have a question that very much makes sense to ask all of you. You see, we've set out to build this device to be a 10 gigabit capable networking beast, and from how things are looking right now, I don't even have the slightest doubt in my mind that we'll succeed. But, unfortunately, I guess, we're not building this device in a vacuum. In fact, quite the opposite, the router market is very competitive and we want to make sure we hit the price to performance sweet spot. And to do that, we have a couple of options. But before we get to them, there's one thing you have to understand and that is the price of the most expect uh, expensive components on the board, so the CPU, RAM and the eMMC storage chip. When it comes to the CPU, we've chosen the 1.6 GHz variant simply because their top tier 1.8 GHz is $20 or roughly 25% more expensive than the 1.6 GHz part. Now, we can stay with this part which costs around $70 or, given what you just saw, even go down to 1.4 GHz version and save another $10 or so. And it's exactly the same story with RAM. Because hardware offloading bypasses the kernel, hardly any RAM is used for networking and thus maybe makes sense to downsize to 4 GB instead of initially planned 8, which would also bring the production cost down for around $30 or so. Now keep in mind those are production costs, so add margin on top, which we haven't calculated by the way, and we easily save around $100 on what the final retail version of the device will cost. So dear viewer, this is where you come in. Would you rather see this device to be a little cheaper by choosing a slightly lower clocked CPU and have the RAM? Or would you prefer to keep it like the networking beast that we envisioned it with 1.6 GHz uh, CPU and 8 gigs of RAM? Unfortunately, I cannot promise one way or the other yet because there are of course a number of other factors at play here. But trust me when I say that the opinion of my audience matters a lot. In fact, we already made a number of changes in the past based on your feedback. So please keep being awesome. Tomasz from Slovenia, signing out.